We know from our study of the Reformation not long ago that the motto of the Reformation was, after darkness, light. John Calvin, among others, really believed that it was the light of God's word that would dispel the darkness that had long enveloped the church. History tells us that Calvin preached six times every week. And I'm always amazed when I look at church history and discover how many sermons the great preachers delivered every week. I don't know how they did it. That would kill me. But I understand that Charles Spurgeon preached between four and ten sermons every week. And I know there were other great preachers who delivered multiple sermons every week as well. This was driven by the strong conviction that the light of God's word is urgently needed to drive back the darkness of the world's deceptions. And certain periods of revival and even reformation in the church came about primarily through the diligent proclamation of the word of God. In fact, that's what we see in the book of 1 Samuel. And this is what our text deals with this morning. We see here where God began to raise up prophets for his people who would boldly proclaim his word to them. And Samuel was the first of these prophets God raised up. I also mentioned when I introduced this book that Samuel established schools of the prophets to produce generations of faithful proclaimers of God's word. You could say with the coming of Samuel, prophecy became the instrument of God for the people of God. Or another way to say this is to say the usual vehicle for God's word is prophecy and the usual instrument is the prophet. With Samuel, this pattern became the normal means of communicating God's word. Preaching became the primary way for God to instruct and admonish his people. Now, as I'm sure you know, we're getting ready to move into the period of the kings in Israel's history. But it is interesting and significant, I believe, to note that God never spoke to or through any of his kings. He always spoke through his prophets. And in our passage today, we see where this became the pattern. Whereas Abraham was the father of the faithful and Moses was the mediator of the law, Samuel was the progenitor of the prophetic office. And I like how David, Dale Davis puts it. He says, the contention of 1 Samuel 3 is that Yahweh's people find no prophet without a prophet, and Yahweh is about to profitably profit them. And he's going to do that by raising up this man, Samuel, among them. Now, 1 Samuel 3 divides naturally into three sections, but we're not going to go directly through it as you might guess. We're going to tie verse 1 of this chapter with the last two verses of the chapter and even the first half of chapter 4, verse 1. And then we're going to come back and go through the rest of it. And I think you'll see why we're doing this in just a moment. But we begin with the rise of God's prophet. Look with me at chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. The first sentence highlights the fact that God was at work raising up his prophet to lead his people. Samuel is in the temple ministering to the Lord before 
Eli. He is growing in his knowledge of God. The word for boy there does not mean he was a toddler. Uh, this, by this time, he is probably a teenager. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that he was 12 years old when he received his prophetic calling. He had been in the temple since he was about three years old. And by this time, he no doubt considers Eli his father because he has spent his entire boyhood under his tutelage. He has been learning the ropes as far as ministering as a priest in the tabernacle. But that second sentence in verse 1 is very significant. Look at it again. And word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. The word for visions there points to an important way in which God communicated to his prophets in the Old Testament dispensation. And we find a number of references to visions being given to various prophets. But we need to understand what's being communicated here. This has to do with specific words from God that were communicated to God's people through his prophets. These were days in which the canon of Scripture was not complete, and God was still audibly communicating with his people. But he did that through his appointed prophets. He didn't speak this way to the people in general. And in Hebrews, we saw where this way of communicating with his people has now ceased, now that the canon of Scripture is closed. So we need to be careful, not only about thinking that God is still speaking to people through visions today, but also we need to be careful about a modern understanding of the term vision here. That is not what the Bible writers intended to communicate. For example, how many times have you heard Proverbs 29, 18, which says, where there is no vision, the people perish, as a reference to the need for having creative, resourceful planners, and if you don't have that in your organization, you may not survive. You got to have vision right? That's the way it's communicated. That is a modern, a common modern understanding of the word vision, but that is not what the authors of Scripture had in mind. A better translation of Proverbs 29, 18 is found in the RSV, where there is no prophecy, the people cast off restraints. What's being said here? This has to do with the fact that the people of God don't do very well when they don't have a clear word from God guiding them, when they don't have clear instruction from God's word. So we need to be careful here in understanding what this is saying. What 1 Samuel 3, 1 is declaring is that God had, had not been speaking directly to his people except in rare circumstances. And perhaps the idea is that because few were obeying God, he had stopped speaking to them. And we need to remember the historical context here. This is coming right on the heels of the period of the judges, and that period was a very dark period in the history of Israel. And Part of that is characterized by the fact that God was not speaking much during that 350-year time. Prophetic revelation was extremely rare during this period. The judges exercised limited authority over usually just one or two tribes in Israel. And although there were some victories during that time, God had not yet chosen a prophet to speak for him to the entire nation. And one reason for that may have been that 
no one during that time had emerged who had a heart that was fully committed to God. But now God is going to raise up his prophet for his whole people. And one thing we absolutely need to understand is that God's word is a precious gift to his people. In Shiloh at this time, the Bible says that precious gift of God's word was seldom given. So we need to ask the question, why was God so silent? Why was he not speaking to Israel? Well, in Scripture, the silence of God is usually connected with his judgment. It is often seen as the Lord removing the light of his word and allowing his people to wander in darkness, which they likely prefer. But many Old Testament passages support this fact, that this is a symbol of God's judgment. For example, when God announced his judgment on Israel through the prophet Amos around 760 B.C., He threatened a famine, but not a famine of bread or water. It was a famine of hearing the words of Yahweh. In Amos chapter 8, the prophet declared that the people were going around everywhere seeking a word from God, but they couldn't find it. God was silent. In Psalm 74, we read where Israel withered under the hand of God's wrath, especially displayed in the enemy's destruction of the temple. But it was aggravated by the fact that there was no longer any prophets in Israel. The real problem was God had gone silent. Dr. Davis writes, tragic enough to have Yahweh's sanctuary going up in smoke Tragic enough when God forces us to walk in darkness, but a silent darkness is unbearable. Just read Psalm 74. It is clear there that the absence of God's word is a major contributor to the misery of God's judgment and wrath. We're even going to see that later on in this book. We're going to see where King Saul will understand the removal of God's word as a signal of the loss of God's presence and blessing. But the good news here in 1 Samuel 3 is that God is going to break his silence as he raises up his prophet to speak to his people. A brand new era is beginning, and to see this, we need to drop down to verse 19. Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now God is going to be speaking to Israel on a regular basis. Now his silence is going to be broken. Now his word will no longer be rare and intermittent. There is now an authorized, on-duty, divinely appointed prophet in the midst of God's people. And listen, the ongoing faithful proclamation of God's word is the primary means of God's grace among his people. That is what God uses to change our lives and to transform us into the image of Christ. This is the main message of 1 Samuel chapter 3. Dr. Davis writes, if contemporary believers have a church where social activities committee meetings, and nifty programs have not eclipsed the place of the word of God. 
if the teaching of the word of God stands at the heart of the church's life, if there is a pulpit ministry where the scriptures are clearly, accurately, and helpfully preached, then they are rich in the grace of God. This is the main lesson of this text. We can't afford to suffer a famine of God's word. But someone might say, well, pastor, you know, we can't really have a famine of God's word today because we now have the completed canon of scripture, right? That's wrong. We can suffer a famine of the word of God in the church today. What makes the word of God rare? Well, in Eli's day, it was because Yahweh was not giving it frequently. But in our day, it can become rare because of the receiving end. How many of you here this morning have ever gotten water in your ear and you couldn't get it out? Let me see your hand. Anybody? Yeah, wow, that's common. You would be amazed at how much gunk you can collect in your ear. And oftentimes, that fluid can build up in the canals of your ear very slowly over a long period of time until your hearing is reduced dramatically. In the same way, that is exactly what happens to the people of God from a spiritual perspective. In Mark 4, Jesus talked about the danger of people who no longer have ears to hear. In fact, the ability to hear spiritually is spoken of as a gift from God. But to change the analogy, starvation is not always due to a lack of food. Sometimes it's due to a lack of appetite. And sometimes... When there is a famine of God's word, it is because people have lost their appetite for it. They prefer something else. And sometimes it's because preachers have turned to something else. They're no longer faithfully giving God's word. Well, this is the bedrock of this passage. This is the starting point. God is raising up a prophet to be in the midst of his people, and he's going to speak through his prophet to radically reform his nation. And by the way, before we move on, notice chapter 3, verse 19 again. Notice that it says, the Lord was with Samuel and let none of his words fail. MacArthur says this has a double meaning. He says, on the one hand, it means that Samuel's prophecies were all fulfilled by the Lord, which proved that he was a true prophet of God. On the other hand, it also means that Samuel never failed to deliver God's message to his people. In fact, Samuel was tested in this regard as soon as he was called, as we'll see in just a moment, but he was faithful. As he demonstrated over and over again in his life and ministry, he was always committed to delivering God's word exactly as he received it. And that is a critical commitment for any preacher of God's word. There must be a strong determination on the part of God's prophet to always proclaim what God says no matter how it is received. There must be such a high regard for God's word that it drives everything he does. And of course, today we have the completed written word of God. But if the message of the preacher today does not coincide and line up with the clear teaching of Scripture, then he's not really speaking the message from God. Well, we have to move on or we'll never get through all this. Not only do we see here the rise of God's prophet, but secondly, we see the response of God's prophet. 
Now, in chapter 3, verses 2 through 10, we see the highlight of Samuel's call to the prophetic ministry. This is something very familiar to most of us. This is often seen as something fit for a children's Sunday school class, but it has important truth for us adults as well. It is a little slow in developing. We don't see the main verb until verse 4. We're given the details of Eli's poor eyesight and that the time of day is it's at night. And, and we're given the detail that the lamp of God has not yet gone out and that Samuel is lying on his bed, interestingly enough, in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. But when we get to verse 4, we see the main point. Then the Lord called Samuel. The Hebrew word for called appears 11 times in this section, so it is obvious what it is describing. No doubt this is the theme of the paragraph. I believe this is a graphic picture here of the effectual call of God, but some who might be reading this account for the first time may wonder if God's call is going to succeed or not. Apparently, this word from God was so clear and audible that Samuel was sure that Eli was calling him, and he thought this repeatedly. The text tells us much about the character and willingness of Samuel, but why was he so slow in grasping what was happening? Well, verse, verse 7 explains it to us. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. Please understand, this statement explains it does not blame. The connotation here is much different from what we saw in chapter 2 verse 12, where it says the sons of Eli did not know the Lord. The point here is that Samuel had not yet had any direct experience with Yahweh and had not yet received any direct revelation from him. Because of that, it is no wonder that the call of God baffled him. Samuel is in uncharted territory here. It wasn't until Eli finally figured out what was happening that everything fell into place. And by the way, look at verse 8 for a moment. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. Duh. I believe this is a reflection of this high priest's spiritual dullness. He should have discerned what was going on long before now, but he finally got it. Let's note a couple more details in this section, and then we'll look at some applications for us today. In verse 4, and really all throughout this section, we see Samuel saying, here I am, here I am. This is the Bible's way of describing the willing heart of Samuel. He has a servant's heart that is willing to crawl out of bed in the middle of the night to respond to the call of what he thought was his master. And of course, he grew in his understanding of his role as a prophet of God. But even here, we see that he was always quick to respond. And part of the reason why the word of the Lord was rare in those days may have been that there had not been anyone with a heart like this before. There had been no one who had given themselves fully to the Lord in such a way that God could use them as he did Samuel. But we see something very unique in the willingness and the willing heart 
of Samuel here. In fact, note in verse 5, it says, he ran to Eli. He didn't walk. He didn't slowly make his way to where Eli was. He ran. MacArthur says, there is real poignancy in this picture of youthful Samuel running to his master, thinking it was Eli who had called him. He says, his quick response and humble attitude demonstrate that Samuel had a true servant spirit willing to leap out of bed in the darkest hours of the night to answer the call of his master. And notice one important detail in verse 10. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for thy servant is listening. What do we need to note there? Well, note, first of all, that it is the Lord himself that came and stood over Samuel. This was his personal presence. This is not some detached voice or some sort of inner impression. It is God himself who came and stood over the boy and called out to him. Now that's an indication to us that when God calls us first to salvation and then to service, that he calls us personally. It is God himself who comes and stands over us and calls us. Of course, God had a unique role for Samuel that would not be normative for us today, but I think it is within the realm of proper application for us to see that God does the same in our case today when he calls us both to salvation and to service. But beyond that, what should we take from verses 2 through 10? Christians today do not receive direct revelation from God as Samuel did. None of us can say we are in the role of God's prophet in the same way that Samuel was. So how does this apply to us today? Of course, we should reflect the same kind of heart that Samuel had and emulate his attitude toward God. But I think there's more here as well. Rather than asking, how does this apply to me we probably should ask the question, what does this say about God? Because in many places in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, if you understand what is being said about God, then you understand how his word applies to you. And in this section, we see something very important about God. We see his gracious, patient dealing with his future prophet. We see the kindness and gentleness of God. Here we see that the Lord is not some overbearing, impatient master that is quick to punish someone who does not immediately understand and respond to his call. He recognizes Samuel's willing spirit and he continues to call him over and over again even when he misunderstands at first. This is not only a new step for Samuel, but this is a new point of departure for Yahweh's dealing with Israel as a whole. So God is not in any hurry here. There is time for Samuel to catch on. Or as Davis puts it, God is not heaving an exasperated sigh. He is not ready to berate Samuel for being so dense. He does not launch into a tirade about how Samuel never gets anything right. Listen, aren't you glad God is patient with us? Aren't you glad he gives us time to understand him and his ways? You remember what Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 12? He said, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. 
You're not ready for all these things right now, but you will be someday. God is patient. He allows us to grow in our understanding. So what should be our response? Give thanks to God for his patience, but keep growing toward that level of maturity he desires for us. Well, there's one last section in this chapter, and here we see the responsibility of God's prophet, the responsibility of God's prophet. In chapter 3, verses 11 through 18, we see that any prophet of God has a heavy responsibility to proclaim exactly what God has revealed. In verse 11, Yahweh communicates to young Samuel an ear-buzzing word, or literally a word that makes both ears tingle. What a way to start your career as a prophet. I mean, what a heavy burden for a young teenager. His very first revelation from God has to do with the judgment that is going to come on the house of Eli, whom he now considers as his father. The message of judgment is basically that because Eli has not restrained the evil of his two sons who have treated the things of God with contempt, that they are all going to have to pay with their lives. Because of the heaviness of this message, it is not surprising that Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, as verse 15 says. Of course, Eli helped Samuel out by putting him under a curse from God if he did not tell him everything. And so Samuel held nothing back. Verse 18 says, So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said then, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. But before we go into the details of the text here, let's consider the lesson and the application that we find here. Samuel's call as God's prophet highlights the heavy responsibility that is placed on anyone who would speak for God. The responsibility is to proclaim all that the Lord has revealed exactly as he has given it. This is the mandate of every preacher of God's word. We don't have the freedom to pick and choose which parts we like and communicate those while keeping the rest to ourselves. This was Samuel's first test and he passed it with flying colors. He held nothing back from all God had declared. And unlike many today, he was a faithful prophet. He proclaimed the full word of God. Now, please understand, being a faithful prophet is not easy. You often have to say things people do not want to hear. Samuel was immediately exposed to the great tension that every prophet of God faces. As Davis puts it, he is caught in a dilemma only a true prophet knows. The true prophet must speak Yahweh's word, yet he recoils from speaking judgment. He will speak judgment because truth is at stake, but he cringes to speak it because compassion moves him. There is always a great tension in the proclamation of the word of God. Every authentic messenger of God's word understands this tension. In fact, he lives it every single day. Old common, the old commentators call this the prophet's cross. The prophet's cross. Davis writes, if a preacher, for example, never places you under The criticism of God's word never tells you your sin, but only smothers you with comfort. You must wonder if he is a phony. Oh, let's see. Does that apply to the pastor of the largest church in America today? 
course it does. Davis then goes on and balances this out with the other extreme as well. He says, if his preaching contains only the judgment note and seldom offers comfort and encouragement, one must ask if he actually cares for God's people. But if he has a high regard for both the truth of God, even if it is judgment, and for the troubles of the church, he will retain the proper tension in the biblical word. He will both afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. It was a reflection of Samuel's character that he loved his master so much that he did not want to give him the bad news. But it was also a reflection of his character that he ultimately told him everything. A faithful prophet proclaims both the good news and the bad news, and the gospel, as you know, contains both. There is the good news that all who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will have everlasting life. But there's the bad news that all who don't will suffer eternal condemnation. A faithful prophet must proclaim both. But let's go back now and just get a couple details in closing here from the text of this section. Look at verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. This same phrase will be used later to describe the news that Jerusalem had been captured by King Nebuchadnezzar when the judgment of God fell on the southern kingdom. It means this is a sobering message indeed. Look with me at verse 12. It says, In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And here we need to remember that God had already sent an unnamed prophet to announce judgment on Eli and his family. So even though I am referring to Samuel as God's first prophet, there was already another prophet on the scene when God appointed Samuel as the first official prophet. God raised up Samuel to bring about this radical transformation in Israel, but there were other men of God who were proclaiming his word as well. And look at verse 13, for I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Now that's the New American Standard, but I think that's a bad translation here. It should say, he did not restrain them because we saw in chapter 2, he did in fact rebuke them, but he failed to restrain them in the sense of removing from the office of the priesthood. Their problem was not that Eli failed to verbally warn them of their sin. The problem was that he refused to take any action to remove them from that role. And when he failed to do that, God himself stepped in and removed all of them by killing them. Well, what do we do with this passage? How should we respond today? First, we need to understand that God, at certain times in history, raises up a special prophet that he uses to bring revival and reformation to his people. Samuel would become God's provision for directing his people through a pivotal time in the history of Israel. And as such, he is the father of prophetic succession. All the other great prophets in Scripture come from his influence. Now with Samuel, we can say the word of the Lord has been, now become common. With Samuel, there were there was, as we might say, a prophet in residence at Shiloh. And God continually spoke through Samuel to his people. 
As chapter 4, verse 1 says, his word began to go to all Israel. As for the application for the church in our day and time, we don't need any additional word from God because we have his full and complete word. We just need to heed that word. We need to hear it and do it. Back in chapter 3, verse 10 when it says that Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. The word listening means to hear with a view of obeying. That must be our attitude for God and his word. How are we doing with that? Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning you'd help us to be people of your word, that we would be people who uh, have an appetite for it. We, have a, we would be a people who, uh, have a desire to line up with it and obey it, to heed it, to do it. And Lord, we see this morning how important your word is. And Lord, we thank you for this wonderful treasure, this precious gift of your written word that you've given to us, your complete revelation. But Lord, we know that we need to abide by it. So, Lord, help us to do that as your people. Lord, we pray if there's someone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we pray they would come to know you today. And, Lord, we pray that as we respond now to your word, that we would respond in a way that would please and honor you. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going to have some elders here near the front uh, when we conclude our service in just a moment. If you need to make some kind of commitment to Christ or you need to respond in some way, make some kind of decision, um, then you come and talk to one of these men. They will help you with that and encourage you to do that. Well, we are uh, going to be back tonight at 6 o'clock, and our students are going to be leading our worship tonight, so that's going to be a treat for us as well.